This is KGW News at 11. But our top story tonight is a maddening look at a chain of events that led to the Vancouver woman being shot and killed in a school parking lot. Tiffany Ojeda had tried time after time to keep her estranged husband behind bars, worried he would kill her. Each time he was released until the moment her worst fear was realized. Our Mike Benner has a look at the new information in this case. What a wonderful human being she was. If the turnout at Sunday's candlelight vigil is any indication, Tiffany Ojeda Hill will undoubtedly be missed. The mother of three was gunned down in the parking lot of a Clark County school. Authorities say her estranged husband, Keelan Hill, pulled the trigger, killing her and injuring her mom before turning the gun on himself. This case has gotten to me since the day you guys reported on it. Michelle Bart is president and co-founder of the National Women's Coalition Against Violence and Exploitation. She says the justice system should protect people like Tiffany. Ultimately, Tiffany may still be here. But instead, it failed her. And for proof, all you have to do is look at what happened in the weeks leading up to the deadly shooting. On September 11, Tiffany reports that Keelan pushed her into a wall and tried to keep her from calling 911. Keelan is arrested, but the very next day he's released from jail on bail and told not to contact Tiffany. On September 14th and 19th, Keelan's accused of contacting Tiffany, a violation of that no contact order. Moving on to October, October 6th, in fact, Keelan tries to buy a rifle from a Walmart in Multnomah County, but a background check hits on the domestic violence case and he's denied. Four days later on October 10th, Keelan is again accused of contacting Tiffany. On November 7th, he's accused of contacting Tiffany yet again, only this time detectives find a GPS tracker on Tiffany's car and Keelan's arrested. The next day on November 8th, police complete a danger assessment with Tiffany. She's placed in the extreme risk category. On November 13th, prosecutors ask a judge to raise Keelan's bail from $75,000 to $2 million, saying that Tiffany is at risk of being killed. A judge sets bail at $250,000. I want to know why it is that the judges in Clark County are not taking the recommendations set forth by investigators, witnesses, victims, and the prosecutors that are trying to protect the victims. Why the judge refused to listen to prosecutors eats away at Bart, because on November 21st, Keelan bailed out of jail. And five days later, on November 26th, he's accused of shooting and killing Tiffany and injuring her mother. You've got three children that will be traumatized the rest of their life. They were in the car. And then you've got Tiffany's mother that was shot that will be traumatized. Tiffany's friends have vowed to help change the system in hopes of saving other victims of domestic violence from this heartbreaking outcome. Back to you. Heartbreaking, upsetting, a lot of words to describe it. Mike, thank you. Uh, still developing tonight, Portland police are searching for a hit and run driver, uh, hit a woman and her dog and did not stop. You see the surveillance video here. It was captured on camera. You can see a red vehicle make that left turn and run into Mandy Thompson and her dog. Then keep on driving. It happened yesterday morning at Southeast Belmont and 20th. Mandy says she was in a crosswalk at the time. After getting hit, she took her dog to the vet, then headed to the hospital. She hopes the person who hit her will come forward. That's the main person that should have stopped. You know, other bystanders were stopping, but that's the person who's responsible. And um, whether it was an accident or they're distracted or whatever happened, you know, it's really affecting our lives. You can see she was injured there. There's another look at the car. Mandy has a broken knee. Her dog has some scratches on its paws. The surveillance video shows that car, which appears to be a red Toyota Matrix. If you recognize it, call Portland Police. We now know what caused a two alarm fire, but destroyed a home and damaged another in Lake Oswego last night. Investigators say it was a chimney fire and a very unusual one. Because of that, firefighters have a warning for homeowners. Catherine Cook has the story. Fire in Lake Oswego. It's what neighbors on Oriel Lane came home to Monday evening. By Tuesday, this is all that remained. Had the winds been going in a different direction, it would have been our house. Siobhan Davis lives next door. She says a man and his two kids lived in this house along with their puppy. 
who didn't make it. Came right over when he got home, pounded on the door, and told us that um, his house was on fire. And like I said, I grabbed the cat, my son grabbed the dog, and we ran outside. It was frightening. I mean, really, it, it knocked some sense into me. Mark Halliston lives a few houses down and took this video. I went home and checked all my uh, smoke alarms, my fire extinguishers, my egress to get out of my room if I had to. Wow, this is... This is so devastating. Lake Oswego Fire Marshal Herod Zoutendijk says the fire started in the chimney chase. That's the wall space around the fireplace and chimney. It flared up a day after the last fire in the fireplace was built and burned out. I think what happened is the heat from the fireplace made the wood behind it brittle. It just has to have a little draft and then it just flares up. Zoutendijk says many fireplaces, like this one, are designed for smaller fires. He says building larger ones can create excessive heat and hazard. So really a takeaway is, you know, keep your fires smaller, uh, use good dry wood so it doesn't create creosote, and then if you do have a lot of creosote, make sure you clean your chimney periodically. Valuable information firefighters hope will keep this from happening to anyone else. Pretty sad, heartbreaking to see the Christmas ornament in the front yard. It's a great dad. This time of year, there are a lot of potential fire hazards around the home, certainly fireplaces, but also candles, space heaters, and even Christmas trees if they're in the wrong spot. Lake Oswego Fire has posted a lot of information designed to keep your family and your home safe. We've posted a link on KGW.com. In Lake Oswego, Katherine Cook, KGW News. Now to get you caught up on tonight's other headlines, a terrible accident has a homeless man in the hospital tonight. He was sleeping under a tarp on the East Bank Esplanade in Southeast Portland and was run over by a garbage truck. He has severe injuries to both of his legs. Police say the garbage truck driver saw the tarp but didn't realize anyone was under it. It's not clear yet if he'll face any charges. The school bus driver who crashed near Forest Grove last month will not be charged. The Washington County District Attorney's Office decided not to file charges after reviewing the evidence. The 20-year-old driver was originally cited for DU, uh, DUII. The Sheriff's Office could still give the driver a citation. Ten kids were on board at the time of the crash. No one was hurt. Washington officials are proposing a new tax to fund wildfire fighting efforts. The state's commissioner of public lands wants to raise $63 million to modernize firefighting helicopters, add more full-time crew, and maintain the land to reduce the fire risk. The proposed tax would show up as a surcharge on property and car insurance policies. It would cost the average household an extra dollar a month. After spending nearly a decade in prison, an Oregon man's conviction has been overturned. Nicholas McGruff. McGuffin, his, uh, he was convicted of manslaughter back in 2011 for the death of his girlfriend. It's a case that brought a lot of attention to the small Coos County town of Coquille. Our Devin Haskins explains how this all developed. This is overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. After all this time. In 2010, Corey Courtright got her closure. An arrest had been made in her daughter's death. Ten years earlier, 15-year-old Leah Freeman had gone missing near the small town of Coquille in Coos County. Freeman's body was dumped down a steep hill and wouldn't be found for another five weeks. For a decade, her mom waited for justice. I love her. That's what I, love I miss her. <laughs> and I'll do what I have to do to get her justice. We'll see it through. A jury found Nicholas McGuffin guilty of manslaughter and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. His lawyer says he's always maintained his innocence. He's been fighting to prove his innocence since he was convicted. So he, of course, was absolutely stunned when we found this DNA evidence. Analysts at the Oregon State Crime Lab found DNA evidence on Freeman's shoes. They couldn't definitively say if it was DNA or what they call background noise on an instrument, saying, quote, it could not be thoroughly and properly supported to a responsible scientific standard. OSP says it was available to both sides, but never brought up in court. In 2014, the Oregon Innocence Project took on McGuffin's case and had the DNA retested. Turns out it belonged to another man, not McGuffin. On Friday, his conviction was overturned. He's been incarcerated for the last nine years for a crime he didn't commit, and he wants to go home. The Coos County DA had difficulty finding the right words after learning about the decision. Uh, it's, it's a bit frustrating for us because... Uh, 
we did what we thought was right in the case, and then to have this happen, which is basically outside of our control. McGuffin still has a long way to go before becoming a free man. The Oregon Department of Justice has 30 days to file an appeal. If they lose that appeal or they decide not to file one, the case would then go back to the Coos County DA's office. They could then either retry the case or drop the charges altogether. Devin Haskins, KGW News.